While it's perfectly normal to take some influence from other creative works, there are times when this is taken too far, with some works getting outright stolen, pilfered, snatched, filched, purloined. There's a certain art form to this, as you can't steal too much without facing a lawsuit, although even that didn't stop some works from doing it anyway. I mean no disrespect to any of the people mentioned in this video, however, by the end of this video you may question if creativity even exists. Here are the most incredible yet blatant examples of creative works that are everything but original. It's the same story, told over and over. I want to know in the comments, what's your favorite work that you know borrowed heavily from something else? Also, your boy Bumper Jumper is currently living on McChickens and cans of tuna, so please consider supporting more videos through Patreon and get some awesome benefits like your name featured in my videos and weekly watch recommendations. Attack on Titan is my second favorite anime of all time. The combination of stunning visuals and gripping story took the world by storm, and while the sheer presentation of Attack on Titan makes it appear remarkably original, Attack on Titan actually borrowed heavily from a visual novel video game released in 2006 titled Muv Love Alternative. Isayama has been very upfront and vocal about Muv Love Alternative being a major influence for Attack on Titan. The Muv Love series follows multiple timelines, with Alternative starting off with the main character Takeru waking up crying, unsure if the horrors he just witnessed were some kind of terrifying dream or not. This is exactly how Attack on Titan begins, with Eren having a horrible dream and waking up crying just like Takeru. In Muv Love Alternative, humanity is facing extinction due to a threat known as the Beta, hordes of alien creatures whose origins remain a mystery. The Beta and the Titans are strikingly similar, as they have no sexual organs, they're extremely extremely hostile towards humans, and they come in numerous shapes, sizes, and variations. Faced with a dreadful situation, Takedo and Eren decide to fight back and join the military, despite knowing it's a losing battle. There's a huge focus in both of these works on the growth of these characters during their time training. Both Takedo and Eren question the viability of learning hand-to-hand -hand combat, when in both cases it appears unnecessary. A guy'd have to be stupid to use this. I mean, a knife? The term keep moving forward is said multiple times throughout Muv Love Alternative, which was later molded to be Eren's overarching philosophy. The iconic line see you later also made its way into Attack on Titan directly from Muv Love. There's also a shell, tied in with the idea of wanting to see the ocean for the first time. Muv Love dives deeply into the idea of having memories you shouldn't, either from another lifetime, timeline, or from the future, which becomes an increasingly important theme throughout Attack on Titan. Keep in mind I'm only including some of the more superficial elements stolen from Muv Love, as I'd rather not go too deep into spoiler territory out of respect for those who haven't laid their eyes upon the glory that is Attack on Titan. In terms of storytelling, Muv Love does an excellent job of having several hooks throughout the game, little pieces of unknown information that invoke extreme curiosity. There's a confidential government program created to potentially save humanity against the beta called Alternative 4, with the only clue we have for what it could be is that it has something to do with a brain in a tube and a mysterious girl. I found myself really curious about where exactly the beta came from, what they're after, and if they can actually be stopped somehow. Attack on Titan adopted this identical storytelling technique. Some examples of these hooks in Attack on Titan include uncovering who the female Titan was, the key to the basement, and of course the true origin of the Titans. I remember itching to find out the secret Grisha had hidden in the basement, along with the explanation for where Titans came from. The supremely unique art style of Attack on Titan and the peculiar design of the Titans has cunningly made it stand on its own, despite the heavy influence taken directly from Muv Love Alternative. It's without a doubt that Isayama brilliantly expanded and enhanced the story of Muv Love. He borrowed several concepts from Muv Love and applied it in a more gruesome and action-packed way. Applying many of his own creative elements throughout, along with my absolute favorite soundtrack of all time. Ninja Scroll is a 1993 film that inspired several of my all-time favorite works. Among these is Naruto, where we can see striking similarities in the overall landscape and the type of attacks like ninjutsu and genjutsu. Here we see the inspiration for Shadow Possession Jutsu as well as the iconic Shadow Clone Jutsu, along with possibly the inspiration for Shino's ability to control insects and Orochimaru's ability to shed snake skin. There's another creative work that took an undeniable amount of influence from Ninja Scroll. I'm talking about Ninja Gaiden 1, and it happens to be one of my favorite video games of all time. This gloriously difficult game makes Dark Souls look like Cooking Mama. The Ninja Gaiden series has been around since the late 80s and when shifting from 2D to 3D, it's clear that Team Ninja was looking at Ninja Scroll as a source of reference. Jubei and Kagedo from Ninja Scroll were direct inspirations for Ninja Gaiden's Ryu and Ayane, both visually and in their behavior. A stoic ninja who only follows his own path takes down otherworldly forces using a combination of swordsmanship and the elements to do it. Along the way, Ryu meets Muramasa, a one-to-one -one clone of the old man from Ninja Scroll. There's a resonating visual arts 
style in both works, along with a sense of effortlessness in Jubei that shines through really well in the Ninja Gaiden series. Other than 3. Ninja Scroll closes with Jubei walking off as we see that he tied Kagedo's headband to his sword. Ryu uses a gemstone from his childhood friend to unlock the ultimate form of his dragon sword. The Ninja Gaiden series has borrowed so many creative ideas from Ninja Scroll and I couldn't be more grateful. For years, Square Enix has watched as the Pokemon franchise raked in money hand over fist with the idea of capturing monsters. It wasn't until 2016 that we got a direct response in the form of a turn-based JRPG known as World of Final Fantasy. World of Final Fantasy adopted the concept of catching monsters, doing this masterfully. The monsters in this world are called mirages, and they have what are called transfigurations, which is the equivalent to evolving Pokemon. With the introduction of the stack system, every character in Mirage has a size of either small, medium, or large. You're allowed one of each per stack for both characters. This opens the door for so much creative control and adds an entirely new layer of strategy. The player can toggle between full size, which is large, or chibi funko pop size, which is medium. You can stack a small and medium sized monster on top of you, or go chibi and use a large and a small size monster. There are seemingly endless combinations of stacks with compound benefits, but keep in mind weaknesses stack up too, making this a really interesting mechanic. There's so much room for trial and experimentation. World of Final Fantasy shares a leveling system extremely similar to the Sphere Grid from Final Fantasy X, which works incredibly well. The visuals are great and I really enjoyed the story. Despite how the game is geared for more of a younger audience, I found some very mature themes and storytelling elements throughout. World of Final Fantasy does an amazing job of capturing that satisfaction and collecting monsters. A lot of the joy of this game comes from exploring and capturing every mirage. World of Final Fantasy combines the unique and more fantastical designs of monsters familiar to the Final Fantasy franchise with the smooth mechanics familiar to Pokemon fans. There's also plenty of fan service for longtime Final Fantasy players, with the most beloved characters across the franchise playing a prominent role in the game. The distinct chibi art style, the inclusion of stacks, and the familiar monsters across the Final Fantasy series makes World of Final Fantasy stand on its own two legs as a marvelous game. Silent Hill Homecoming stole from itself, an act I can only refer to as creative cannibalism. Silent Hill Homecoming is arguably the turning point that marked the downfall of the series for many fans. It was the second entry in the series not developed by Team Silent, with Western developer Double Helix Games handling the project. With high expectations and a new team, Double Helix Games decided to piggyback off of what had already worked gloriously in the past. Homecoming shares the exact same overarching plot as Silent Hill 2. James in the second entry is looking for his wife, fighting the grotesque manifestations of his inner psyche along the way, only to find out that he was delusional, his wife was dead this whole time, and a huge plot twist at the end. Alex in Silent Hill Homecoming is looking for his brother Josh, fighting horrific monsters along the way, only to find out that the idea of him being a soldier was a delusion, Josh was dead this whole time, and the exact same plot twist from Silent Hill 2 happens at the end. Everything not borrowed from Silent Hill 2 came almost directly from the psychological horror movie released in 1990, Jacob's Ladder, a film that follows a Vietnam War veteran struggling with crippling post-traumatic stress disorder. Jacob's Ladder is dark and unsettling having us experience Jacob's nightmarish hallucinations, unable to tell what's real and what's not. Things go from happy or mundane to morbid and hostile. Without a doubt, the Silent Hill franchise has drawn massive inspiration from Jacob's Ladder, such as Valtiel's head movement, James's outfit design, and multiple settings throughout the film, like the subway and hospital, to name a few. One of the endings of Homecoming was also taken directly from the film. My unpopular opinion is that this actually worked really well. Silent Hill was in desperate need of a new combat system and chose to play off the themes and influences that defined the series years ago. This is a common creative strategy. Despite criticisms that the game lacked innovation, the graphics were improved, the combat system was revamped, and the overall experience was horrifyingly memorable. The 2018 film A Star Is Born is the first movie directed by Bradley Cooper, while also playing the role of Jackson Maine, a famous musician dealing with a crippling drinking problem. The movie is about the emotional strain of being in a high-profile relationship. A Star Is Born is actually the third remake by the same name. All four renditions follow a passionate couple dealing with the pressures and complex dynamics that come with immense fame. A a Star is Born also borrowed heavily from the 2009 movie Crazy Heart. Being his directorial debut, it makes sense that Bradley Cooper wanted to have several references to bounce off of. Jackson Maine is a revamped version of Bad Blake. Both movies are about a famous country singer with a serious addiction, struggling to keep it all together with the world on their shoulders. A Star is Born took a solid formula and combined that with breathtaking performances and some of the best writing I've ever seen in film. A Star is Born modernized a tried and true formula that stood the test of time, enhancing it in just about every way possible. The movie is a visual masterpiece, with some of the most beautiful cinematography I've ever seen. The movie is uplifting and exhilarating, while also being unapologetically raw and realistic, showing the life-changing highs and earth-shattering lows that come with being famous and falling in love. I can tell this was cooking up in Bradley Cooper's head for a long time, making A Star Is Born one of the most beautiful and captivating films you can watch. You promised me you were gonna be I always say I love you. 
Always remember us this way. Imagine falling in love with ChatGBT. The concept of developing an intimate relationship with artificial intelligence has been around for a while, but many people believe Spike Jonze's 2013 film titled Her drew direct inspiration from the 2002 anime Chobits. While Spike Jonze has never cited Chobits as an inspiration for his film, both works have striking similarities. Chobits follows a sensitive protagonist who comes upon a top-of-the-line AI assistant. Over time, this blossoms into a romance between the two, which is the exact same premise as Her. Both Chobits and Her dive deeply into themes like forbidden love, self-identity, and discovering the true capabilities of artificial intelligence. Both works focus heavily on society's view of being in a relationship with an AI. But it does make me very sad that you can't handle real emotions, Theodore. They are real emotions. Chobits is more slice of life and lighthearted, while her takes a bittersweet and intellectual approach, showing that the vast differences between humans and AI is exactly what makes these relationships impossible. Her took this concept and crafted a profoundly interesting and gorgeously directed movie. Chobits and her are 11 years apart, and the vastly different presentation of the film leaves it up to viewers if any direct inspiration was taken. What do you think? While some works manage to enhance and outshine the source material, other works fail to reach the same level of quality. Here are four works that are so amazing they inspired copies that could never live up to the original. Wow. Cool. Not really. Back in 2006, Gears of War took the world by storm with innovative mechanics and exhilarating gameplay. Microsoft was dominating the third-person shooter genre, and with the release of Gears of War 2, this was taken to a whole nother level. Gears of War was bringing in profits that had other publishers salivating with jealousy. With the major success of Gears of War 2, Sega decided they had enough. In 2012, Sega released Binary Domain, a cover-based shooter with the exact same framework as Gears of War, but without the personality, replacing the gritty and terrifying Locust with lifeless robots. Sega actually released two third-person shooters in the span of two years, looking to capitalize on the changing gaming landscape. Vanquish stands on its own a bit better because of the cyber-futuristic setting, but Binary Domain feels like Gears of War without a soul. The animated film Paprika will never get a live action adaptation because Christopher Nolan already made it. It's called Inception and I can't believe he got away with it. Paprika is a Japanese animated film directed by Satoshi Kon. The film explores the ambitious idea of sharing dreams and it does this in colorful and exuberant detail. There's a device known as the DC Mini which allows people to share dreams. This technology is new and underregulated and therefore extremely dangerous in the wrong hands. Both Paprika and Inception deal with the consequences of dream manipulation. Inception takes a high stakes action approach whereas Paprika takes a more psychologically explorative and surreal approach. Both films deal heavily with the physical manifestations of the subconscious. The question becomes, did Paprika plant the idea for a movie about dream manipulation in Christopher Nolan's head? Well, Paprika was released in 2006, a good four years prior to the release of Inception. There are several scenes that appear to be heavily inspired by Paprika, on top of the overarching idea of dream manipulation. While it looks like Christopher Nolan has never directly stated Paprika as an influence for Inception, I would be more surprised if it wasn't. What do you think? Who did it better? If there's no flower, Never be proof. The 1995 film Ghost in the Shell is arguably the most influential movie for the cyberpunk genre, making its way into the gaming industry and being the primary influence for the 1999 movie The Matrix. It's said that when The Matrix was being pitched to the producer, Ghost in the Shell was played on a DVD and they said, we want to do that for real. The Matrix drew inspiration from the futuristic dystopian setting of Ghost in the Shell, along with several common themes like collective consciousness and determining reality from fabrication. Just like Inception, The Matrix takes a more superficial approach, prioritizing big budget action as opposed to the evocative and intellectually stimulating approach of Ghost in the Shell. The 1995 film has a certain sense of class and timelessness, proving that its ideas were ahead of its time. Why did you pick me? Because we are more alike than you realize. Another animated movie that changed cinema forever is the 1998 film Perfect Blue, also directed by Satoshi Kon. The film follows Mima, a famous pop singer who becomes an actress, with her identity being put into question by increasingly exploitative movie roles, a creepy stalker, and someone pretending to be her online. Perfect Blue tackles identity, particularly the identity of a famous personality, along with the line between reality and fiction. This is strikingly similar to the 2010 film Black Swan. The director Darren Aronofsky referenced Perfect Blue as an influence for Requiem for a Dream, where the rights to the animated film were said to have been purchased for this iconic bathtub scene. Oddly enough, he initially denied Perfect Blue as an influence for Black Swan, stating that at best it was a subconscious influence, when Perfect Blue appears to have been a much more prevalent inspiration. Black Swan follows an ambitious ballerina who assumes a new idea 
identity because of the demanding nature of her role as the Black Swan. Both of these films dive into themes like dealing with extremely high expectations, having multiple personalities, and suffering hallucinations induced by high amounts of societal pressure. Both Mima and Nina make a transition they're not proud of as the films progress. Mima deals with the pressures that come with being a Japanese pop idol, and Nina bears the pressures of being a high-performing ballerina. The most striking similarities are visual, with several scene compositions bearing an uncanny resemblance. What do you think? I absolutely refuse to do it! Do you agree that good artists copy, great artists steal? A wise person once said, everything new is a well-forgotten old. I'm Bumper Jumper, dedicated to promoting the most impactful and profound works in video games, movies, TV shows, and anime. Share this video, check out some more of this delicious content, and I'll catch you in the next one.